Zechariah chapter 8 and find verse 23. I'm going to read from the New International Version tonight. If you're all there, say, woohoo. All right, let's go. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, 10 people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we've heard that God is with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Move in power. Amen. You may be seated. I want to start a new series tonight. And I've preached from this text before, and that's not all that uncommon. Uh, I, I'm, un, I'm to understand that Sarah and Jeff Mitchell are in the house. Where are you, Sarah and Jeff? Would you raise a hand somewhere? Where, where? Welcome home, all right? They just moved back from the Bristol Bay, and we're so glad that you're here. Tremendous leaders, and uh, we're glad you're here because we need your help. And God led them back here, and we're so grateful. I'm starting a new series. I think it was in 2018... I preached a series called Holy Spirit Come. How many of you remember that? Some of you might remember that. And it was about the Holy Spirit. And I remember starting off that series with a clip from Lonnie Frisbee. How many of you know who Lonnie Frisbee is? It's not named after the Frisbee, but Lonnie, Lonnie, if you came out of the Calvary Chapel movement, then you would know who Lonnie Frisbee is. Lonnie Frisbee was a hippie drug addict that had a radical salvation. And he came into uh, Papa Chuck Smith's church in Southern California and got radically touched by God. And at that time, hippies were not, well, they, not, they weren't really welcomed in the church. And, and music was very different in the church back then. It was mostly hymns. And this movement started called the Jesus Movement. How many of you have heard of that? They baptized thousands of people in California. And, and then there's the Jesus people in Chicago. And throughout the 70s and on even into the 80s, there was this move of God that took place across America and really across the globe of this great awakening. And when Lonnie Frisbee spoke that one night that he was allowed to speak, and I'm, I'm sure that took a little bit of discipleship before that took place, but when he was there, he spoke, and I've seen a video of it, but he lifts his voice and he says, Holy Spirit, come. And it's like a blanket came over that place there in Southern California. And people began to cry out to God and, and people rushed the altar. And not unlike at other times in history. And I started that series with that story. And as I was seeking the Lord over the past few weeks, and especially today, I was arrested I've had a bit of a, a visitation by the Lord, and I don't feel led to share that exactly right now. But I do feel led to move in this direction, and so, so instead of calling it Holy Spirit, come, I've changed it, and it's now come Holy Spirit. So <laughs> lift your hands and, and make it a prayer. Come on, say, come Holy Spirit. Say it again. Come Holy Spirit. This text is so profound, and we'll look also at the book of Ezekiel chapter 36 here in just a moment. It's, it's at least 20 years ago that I first heard this word and it gripped me. I thought, wow, that's amazing that people would grab a hold of someone and say, please take us to where God is. I mean, that's what the text says, that they'll take hold of the Jew and say, we want to go with you because we heard God is with you. And in fact, I've titled this message... God is here. I want you to say it with all your heart. God is here. Now, theologically, that's true. And I'm going to prove it to you. And I'm going to look at the Old Testament, going to look at the New Testament, going to tie it in and what that really means for us and how to enter into the presence of God. I've found that there are many times people that don't understand how to enter in and and what do you mean by enter in? Well, has anybody ever gotten into a pool? You would enter into a pool. You'd maybe step down the, the stairs. I never do that. I jump. Anybody just jump? No matter what the temperature is, I'm jumping. If I'm going to go swimming, I'm going in. doesn't matter if it's cold or hot, I'm going in. It's, it's probably a good recipe for revival. But this is a prophetic word to me. And it's a prophetic word to us. 
that there's a time that there'd be so many people that would want to go to church. Well, that it would look like this on a Wednesday night. Go ahead and look around. There's not an empty seat hardly here at all. So why is that? I think it's because God is here. And if you can imagine for a moment before we get into teaching and then, of course, preaching to you, because I won't be able to help myself. Teaching and preaching are two different things. If you can imagine for a moment that Jesus would show up at your house. I mean, he'd be there. He'd, he'd, he'd eat dinner with you. He'd, he'd, he'd live with you. He said, well, he does. Well, that's because you have that revelation, but some of you don't understand. He's not a far off, but he's near as the words in your mouth. He actually takes up residence on the inside of us. We are the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But if God is with you, let me just ask you, what would happen when you had difficulties and problems or somebody would even die? Well, difficulties, problems, they would, they would shift and change and God would show up. Mountains would be moved. The dead would be raised. The leper would be cleansed. Come on, somebody say, if God's with me, I'm going to make it. And I, I, I will say out of my encounter with the Lord that, that I'll speak to that for just a moment. For too long, the body of Christ has embraced a survival mentality when God wants you to move on to a thrival mentality. They've embraced, well, if I can just make it, bless God. If I can just make it one more day. Oh, God. Oh, and you wave a white flag of surrender to hope one day Jesus is going to take you home. Listen, he's going to take you home. You stay strong. You just keep keeping on. Come on, somebody say amen. But he didn't leave us here to just survive. He left us here to thrive. He left us here to have life. And man, I might preach tonight. He left us here to have life and life to the full. He left us here to have a, the abundant life. The abundant life. Now, I've found that there's a lot of enemies against abundance. The abundant life. There's a lot of things that want to come against me being happy, joy-filled, and completed. Now, I'm complete in Christ. Some of you know that. Some of you are learning. But he calls us to do things. And in the midst of that call, there comes many, many obstacles like a Mack truck with your name on the front grill. And you have to learn how to overcome. You have to learn how to walk through and, and move things and change things and stand and agree and pray and see God move in power. I'm telling you, there is no impossibilities to the believer. Only people that have grown hopeless and in unbelief. And God knows I've been there too. How can this happen? Or I should say, how has this happened? Because this is happening. I've taken a survey as we, as we move on here and then we'll look at the dwelling place of God. I've taken a survey and literally people are invited to this house and, and maybe even here tonight because someone said to you, bro, I think God's up in there. You're gonna feel something. You walk in that place, it's not normal. There's something different. You drive on the park, they said, why is that? I don't know, something's happened. I think a bunch of people started to believe God's word. That's what I think. All right, a look at the dwelling place of God. Because I do believe this is what's happening, that literally people are taking hold of people in the congregation and saying, man, I, I want to go with you because I heard God's with you. All right, the dwelling place of God. In the Old Testament, there's two focal points. How many? Two. Two focal points on the earth where God dwelled or dwelt. One, the tabernacle. It's fascinating, the tabernacle. Moses has given the blueprints, if I could say it that way, he's given a pattern from God to make a replica of the tabernacle in heaven. Now, that's amazing. And they built this tabernacle, and it's called the tabernacle, and it was to be a place where God would dwell amongst his people in the earth. But it's a replica of heaven. And so literally when you look at the tabernacle and you can go and study the Old Testament, which is types and shadows, a picture book of New Testament reality. Everybody say that, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a picture book of New Testament reality. So when you see the Old Testament, it's actually pointed to something greater. Hebrews talks about that. So the tabernacle points to something greater. Everybody say the tabernacle. The tabernacle points to something 
Nevertheless, God came and dwelled there, pillar of fire, pillar by cloud by day, fire by night. And the, the tent of meeting or the tabernacle, God would come and dwell amongst his people, built in the replica as a replica of that which is heaven. That's the one focal point you'll see in the Old Testament. The second place you'll see the dwelling place of God is the temple. And you can see the temple is built really with the same, um, the same it's, it's similar to the tabernacle, but just a little bit different, but similar because it's the same replica, if you will. And it, it's at its dedication, you can go read this, at the dedication of the first temple, the power of God comes so powerfully that the priests could not perform their duties. They could not continue to do their priestly stuff. What does that mean? I'm doing priestly stuff right now. I'm preaching, I'm teaching you, I'm, 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 I'm talking to you, I'm going to bring illustrations. Now, if the power of God, and I have been in services like this, Power of God comes so strong here, I'm not preaching anymore because I'll be laid out. Some, I won't be able to, I won't be able to do my pastoral duties. Somebody say, wow, that's pretty intense. And some of you have been in meetings like that, and I have too. They're my favorite meetings. It actually is my prayer that God would come and lay hands on us. We'd all end up underneath the pew with tremendous revelation. There was a mistake in the 90s where the power of God was so put on display that then pastors tried to emulate that and never taught the Bible, never preached again. That's not the way it should be. There is preaching under an unction, and then there's times of yielding to the presence and the power of God. The, 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 where we get in trouble now, and uh, you know we don't want to do that tonight. I'm not sure what's going to happen tonight because I do know that God is here. Where we get in trouble is where you preach beyond where you're supposed to, or you try to finish the thing because you spent five or ten hours on it, and then you want to finish what you did instead of backing off and letting God. I'm just telling you, as a pastor, that's the challenge. And so you just have to just be sensitive as a leader, and there's many that are online or that'll see this later that are pastors, and you have to learn how to back away and just let him take the service. And I remember years ago being in Kauai, the power of God hit the place so strong that I was, a ter I was terrified. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't all fun and, 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 and joy. It was, it was the fear of the Lord hit the place. And I really didn't know what was going to happen. Pastor Vince, you were there. There were some other people that were there. They were in this room tonight. And I remember I was terrified because I didn't want to mess it up. And I remember backing off uh, stage left here. And I backed off. I said, God, I don't know what to do. And he spoke so clear to me and said, son, you can take the service and it'll be good. Or you can let me have it. And I thought, by all means, <laughs> take the service. And in that same moment, I saw a flash of blue off to my right-hand side. Pastor Josh was on the piano. He's the president of our organization. Back then, he was in his early 20s. He fell out, got on his face, and then... When he did that, I thought, I better get low, too. And I got, I got low, and I saw a flash of blue off to my left-hand side. And at both times, I saw people getting on their faces and falling out of their chairs. And, and the power of God hit the place so strong. There was, there was three transvestites in the back. I didn't stutter. Or was there four? Three or four. Pastor Vince says there was four, but three left. All I remember is hearing a scream and a, a flash of somebody running for the front door, and it was those three. They hit the front door. We never saw them again, but the one who stayed was completely touched by God. His name, is, his name is Patrick, and he's become one of our leaders in our church. It's 20 years ago. Maybe not quite. The power of God. See, when God is in a place, it changes everything. The temple. So God so filled the temple that nobody could stand anymore. And as you know, Israel sinned. People turned from God. The temple was destroyed and God no longer dwelled among them. They still don't know where the ark is. Well, I know somebody might know. 
We just generally don't know where the ark is, but here's the news. The good news tonight is this. God doesn't live in a temple made by human hands, whether it be a replica of heaven or not. He doesn't live in a tabernacle. He doesn't live in a, a beautiful building somewhere in some far off land. He comes to live inside of your heart. He comes to live inside of my heart by the power of God because God sent his lamb fulfilling the sacrificial system, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. His name is his name is Jesus. God sends his only son, Jesus, God himself. And the writer of, of the gospel of John, John writes, in the beginning was the word, verse one of chapter one, and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. I want you to go down to verse 14. It's a scripture you should memorize. Talking about the dwelling of God in the Old Testament and now shifting to the dwelling of God in the New. The Word became flesh. This is John 1 and 14, New International Version. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory. The glory of the only, the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. In the book of Colossians chapter one, Paul writing to the church in Colossae says that in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, talking about Jesus. We really don't have a framework for that. Jews usually do. But as Gentiles, most of us, and there are some that are Messianic believers or completed Jews here, but most people don't really understand what that means. They don't really understand what does it mean that God came and dwelled in a, a body. It's, it's unthinkable that he would step out of eternity into this cesspool. I know we think creation's beautiful, and it is. It's wonderful, but it is nothing compared to heaven. And God so loved you, he left that and came. And he healed the sick. He showed us what the Father was like. Jesus said, if you've, seen the, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He healed the sick. He set the captives free. He blessed the children. He raised the dead. He raised a 12-year-old from the dead. The widow of Nain's son, she raised, he raised from the dead. He fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000. When it was tax time, he pulled coin out of the fish's mouth. And one gospel writer says he pulled two coins out. And Jesus was crucified after he walked the shores of Galilee. He was crucified on a cruel Roman cross in a false, fake news trial. And a bunch of lies that were put together to crucify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you could try to, they tried to kill God if that was even possible, but it was not possible because on the third day, where, O oh, death is thy sting, as the, psalm, the writer of Psalms prophesied, and on the third day, he got up. He got up. And there's no way to explain the transformed lives of those disciples and Peter who was scared off by a little girl at a fire and denied the Lord three times and the rooster crowed totally transformed coming out of the upper room baptized with with fire soaked saturated filled with the very presence of God somebody who would once reject and curse the Lord now comes out and preaches until 5,000 people get saved how do you explain that he saw the risen savior and he got filled with the spirit how do you explain the likes of you how do you, how do you explain your story? How, do you, how can I explain my story other than God, God saved me, he healed me, he filled me, he touched me, he transformed me. How do you explain hundreds and hundreds of people on a Wednesday night in Alaska in the summer, granted it's raining, for like eight weeks, getting my ark ready. How do you explain it? God raised Jesus from the dead. And it's not a hallucination and it's not, a, it's not some fake story or fake news, it's real. And, and I've proven the resurrection, but, I, but I, I need to move on. I usually prove the resurrection every Easter. The Holy Spirit comes, he said, it'd be better for me to go, which 
When I first read through the Gospels and had them read to me and began to understand, I just did not understand that. How would it be better if you left Jesus? Like, how is that even possible? He said, I'll send the Holy Spirit. They didn't really understand that. I'll send the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity. I'll send the Holy Spirit to you. So God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, they're the triune God, the three-in-one God. And I know you'll have well-meaning people knock on your door and say, the Trinity is not in Scripture. It's not of God. Well, you're not of God. It's only because you haven't really studied and really understand. Of course, Trinity is not in Scripture. It's coined by Tertullian, I think, one of the early church fathers. The principle of the three-in-one hero Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. The Shema. He's God, and he's the same, and he's immutable. He does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God of the Old Testament, now in the New. But having completed the sacrifice so that we don't have to be sacrificing lambs every day and coming to some priest. We come to the great high priest of our confession. His name is Jesus, and we're born again. We've been made new. His blood has cleansed me from every sin and sickness and disease, and he's crafted me in. He's made me to be his own. I'm a new creator in Christ Jesus. Anybody else say amen? amen. He sends the Holy Spirit. Turn to Ezekiel now. When Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, who is God's presence among us, is here. I said, God is here. Amen. Amen. Ezekiel 36. And let's read from verse 26, would you please? New International Version yet again. Prophesying. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. If you're there, say amen. Similar to Jeremiah. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit in you. Come on, somebody say that. He'll put his spirit in me. Make it personal. He'll do what? He'll put his spirit in me. He goes on to say, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors, and you'll be my people, and I will be your God. Wow. I'm going to keep going. Verse 29, I'll save you from all your uncleanness. How beautiful is that? Come on, somebody say, he saved me from my uncleanness. God will give you a new heart. And this would be because you have a new spirit in you. And the Apostle Paul goes on to talk about that as I continue to teach you about the reality that God is here. Come on, bump your neighbor and say, God's here. Bump your other neighbor and say, bro, God's here. Sister, go ahead. Make sure you get the gender right. There's male and female. Amen. Just thought I'd throw that in. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, turn there, 2 Corinthians 3. Come on, we're going to look at a bunch of scripture. I'm teaching you theologically to understand that God is here. And if he is here, if he is, then sickness, disease, infirmity, all the assignment of darkness is broken. We just don't really, many people just don't really believe it. How come everybody's not healed? When everybody's healed, if you're born again. No, they're not. My auntie went, my auntie passed away. I'm sorry your auntie passed away, but if she's born again, she's not sick anymore. Amen. And uh, we contend in the earth for complete miracles. And we see them many times, and there's times where it's a mystery to us, so we don't see it. Nevertheless, we leave the results with God. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3, clearly says the Spirit here is the Holy Spirit. You show that you are a letter from Christ, Paul says to the church in Corinth. The result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Literally, he's talking about the spirit transforming believers. I've been changed. 
I've been treated. You could talk to my mama. She's in the room right now. And she would tell you, that boy's different. I remember my brother, he's given his heart to the Lord here a few years ago. And he's a part of our church. He's working tonight. Otherwise, he'd be here. How many of you know work is good? He's been changed. He's been transformed. He's not the same guy. And I remember talking to him here about a year ago. And I said, you know, now you're like in Christ and everything. I said, did you imagine that I would be pastoring anything like that? He said, no. I said, does it look like, you know, that, you know, when we were kids, did you imagine? He said, no, you're totally different. I don't even know. Thank God. Come on, somebody say, thank God. Come on, lift your hands to heaven and say, oh, uh, I'm totally different. Or, uh, oh, change me. <laughs> uh, change me. And that process of changing, that process of transformation in Scripture is called the process of sanctification. So if you just gave your life to Christ this week, congratulations. Or if you're going to give your life to Christ by the end of this service, it's going to be the, the greatest decision you'll ever make. Your second greatest decision is the one you marry or where you go to church. <laughs> You're right there. <laughs> but when you receive Jesus, you've got to get discipled. The process of discipleship is, is growing to become more like him. Sanctification is daily reckoning the life of Christ in your life and death to your flesh. And if you don't learn how to do that, you're going to still live in the same mindset. Come on, you've got to renew your mind. Can someone say, oh, God, help me? The thoughts that you think, says C.S. Lewis, about God are the most important thoughts you'll ever have. Ezekiel 37, go there, please. Come on, we're, we're looking into the Word a little bit. Ezekiel 37, verse 14. I'll put my spirit in you and you will live. My God, what a verse. And I will settle you in your own land. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. That word live, it is the truest sense of the word. It's not like, how many of you know there's people that have a heartbeat, but they're not living? Not, not, not biblical living. They're alive in that there's biological reactions taking place, but they're living a life of death. They're living a life of destruction, a life of despair, a life of hopelessness. That's not God's plan for you. Come on, look at my baby blues. I'm telling you right now, God's plan for you is to walk in victory and then cause you to really live. I mean, really live life and life to the full. God didn't put disease on you to teach you something or depression and anxiety is some gift from God. That's not a gift from God. He wouldn't even know where to get it. The Christian is the temple, the, the believer. The believer, the Christian is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let me read this to you, Paul, again in 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Gosh, we should read that again. Do you not know that your bodies are the, whole, are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? Question mark. You see, a lot of people don't know that. Come on, let's try it again. This is one of those scriptures that I would highly encourage you to, to memorize and think on and meditate on. Just walk back and forth in your house. Come on, just and repeat it out loud in your car, in the bathroom, in the kitchen. The Holy Spirit, God's Spirit lives on the inside of me. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in me. God lives in me. Ah, God lives in me. I mean, you start speaking that, something begins to transform. Your life begins to change. You are not your own. That's why we can't just do whatever we want to. Your body's not your own. When you receive Jesus, his spirit came on the inside of you. Now, that's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's another message. But it certainly ties in well. 
You are not your own. Come on, somebody say, I belong to God. The gathered church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, for we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the living God. And you st begin to study this. It's, it's the nios of God. It's, it's his spirit comes and fills this place. Listen, I'm glad you're online and I don't want to knock that. I'm glad you're online and you can experience being in church tonight with all of us to a degree. But I promise you, it is no, in no way complete biblical form of going to church. You're getting information and God's touching you by his spirit. And if you're to at all be honest, you would say, oh, he's drawing me to that place because God is there. And yes, his spirit's touching you and there's no distance in the spirit, but you must separate gathering of information from what church really is. Church is not just a gathering information. It's, it's having fellowship one with another. It's, it's being here. God's spirit is here. The Nios, a dwelling place of God. The assembly of God. That's where they actually got it, the assembly of God. The dwelling place of God. It said, if Jesus lives on the inside of me, and Jesus lives on the inside of you, and Jesus lives on the inside of you, does Jesus live on the inside of you? He does. I can see that. Look at that. Wow. Hey. Jesus lives on. Raise your hand if Jesus lives on, on the inside of you. All right. And the rest of you don't like raising your hand. Or you're going to get born again by the end of this message. So if, if Jesus lives on the inside of us by his spirit, then all of us together, there's, there's something profound about the gathered people, the assembly, the ecclesia, the church, called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Am I yelling? Do you have to be so strong? Yes! Some of you don't get it. You don't get it. I looked up just now and saw someone with those two lights, you know? You know how you have those lights and it's like, you can go and read better? I thought it was a devil I was gonna come and cast it out of you there, but I, anyway, I'm glad. Brother Rodney, you're awesome, praise the Lord. I thought, shaka ta ha, it's gonna come back there. Don't make me come back there. Okay. Go into Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 22. Here's the word nios, dwelling place. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. All right, how to experience God's power, God's presence, how to experience him. And this, as I, as I prepared tonight, I just thought, Holy Spirit, really? This is, this is so 101, but here's what I realized. A lot of people never heard 101. And we're growing so fast that there's so many people they've been touched by God, but they've never heard a message like this. I'm gonna teach you how to end. I'm gonna teach you how to get in. Yeah. I'm gonna teach you how to go swimming. Yeah. How do you experience God's presence? Come on, lift your hands to heaven. Come on. Oh. Now, Lord, come make this real to your people. The first thing is how to experience God's presence. Be holy. The Holy Spirit is not just any spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. To be holy means to be totally other than separate, clean, pure. There's a lot of different words to describe what holy is. He's the Holy Spirit. And the, and the Apostle Paul pointed out to the church, you don't sin because you grieve the Holy Spirit. So be holy. Well, how do you be holy? Well, personally. Personally live holy. What do you mean? Don't do that which you shouldn't be doing. How do I find out what that is? Read the Word. Learn the Word. Have fellowship. Hang out with other people that walk in victory. You know, bad company corrupts good character, but I have said it over and over before. When you read scripture and it says one thing, the converse of that is also true. N not the sneaker, not converse the sneaker. The, the opposite of that is also true. Honor mom and dad, have a long life and would live well in the land. It's like one of the 10 commandments, honor your father and mother. So what is the opposite of that? Dishonor mom and dad, shorten your lifespan. That's true. My daughter, 
or one of my children. Oh, it was Hannah. Uh, she watched, Le Le years ago, watched a movie called Lilo and Stitch. I don't really remember exactly what that was, but, and there's a section of that where, uh, I don't know, I don't know who was who, but the little girl said to her mother, I hate you. So she thought she'd try that on. She thought she'd try that to her mother. I hate you. Let me tell you how many times she said that to Pastor Karen. Once. Why is that? She got some training on the hind, the hind seat of her understanding. Why? Because I'm not going to have my, we're not, we understand. You don't let your kids curse you. You don't let your kids disrespect you. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we taught them and it's a process and, and God knows we all need help with being respectful and honoring, but it's so important to live right. If you don't live right, if you don't live holy personally, how could you expect to experience a greater experience of God's power and presence? What would he want to have to do with that? I remember working in a chicken, a chicken farm. Uh, I'm, and I mean like a chicken house. I don't know how many hens were in the house, but it's, you know, thousands. And we would go and offload these 18 wheelers with chickens. And I remember when we first got, started doing it, I'm in, I'm, I'm in like 11 years old, it was child abuse labor or something, I don't know what it was, but <laughs> nobody was paying attention. They gave us $2 an hour, I forget. They taught us how to hold chickens by the legs and you would carry as many as you could and you'd carry two hands and you'd carry them in and then you'd stick them in cages. I remember when I first got there, I, I, I threw up because the smell of the chickens was so bad. Does, does anybody know what I'm talking about? And I, I, I smelled the chickens and I'm like, Ugh! and they're like, you'll be okay. I'm like, no, I'm not, be okay, this is nasty. And they're like, well, get to work anyway. And we, we learned a work ethic. Thank God for that. You need to teach work ethic. You need to teach your kids how to work. Well, you know, I noticed something after about half an hour, 45 minutes. Didn't smell anymore. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like the Lord had mercy on me. Do you know that sin is the same way? Some of you have been doing stuff for, oh, you missed a great place to say, but you've been doing stuff for so long and you've justified it in your mind. And so that you're not, I had somebody tell me, I'm not convicted of that, so I don't need to stop doing it. I'm not convicted of smoking weed. Oh, I'll go over here. I'm not convicted of living with my girlfriend, living with my boyfriend and playing house. I'm not convicted of that. And uh, so as a result, I don't, I'm just gonna keep, you know, doing what I do. Well, just because you're not convicted doesn't mean it's wrong. Conviction, come on, some of your convictions your convictions need to be based on God's word. So if you don't have a conviction about something the word says is wrong, then guess what? You're the one who's supposed to change. You're the, your conscience has been seared. You've been smelling chicken crap for too long. And you think it's okay. It's not okay. Oh, we'll love you. You keep coming here, but we'll keep preaching to you. Everybody say, be holy. be holy, personally. And as a church, now this text, Acts 19 is the text that pastor preached from in Eagle River last night, and they had a move of God. And you know, I think I feel a shift over here. Something shifted today. Actually, I think it was about three days, three days ago for me. There's a shift that took place. In Acts 19, I, I, I mentioned to it an earlier part of the message, the seven sons of Sceva, changing the ministry name to Naked and Bleeding, those guys. Well, what happened is that great fear falls on the church. What do you mean fear? Not boogeyman fear, fear of the Lord, like God is real. Oh my gosh, we better not mess around. 
And they gathered all of these magic scrolls and cursed items. And you can go and read it. It's a picture of revival. It's a picture of what happens when God comes to a place, people throw away their, their they, 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 they step out of the chicken crap. They throw away the things that grieve God. They, they start seeking him. And they're like, oh my gosh, God's for real. I don't want to be a part of the naked and bleeding ministry. I better burn my scroll. I better get rid of my dope. I, get, I better get rid of this stuff. We got to get right. We need to get married. We, oh, I can't do this anymore. I want God. God, we might die. He said, well, that, that's the Old Testament. Uh-huh, Ananias. You tell me about it, Sapphira. Go ahead, tell me. The youth ministry came and buried both of them. New Testament. Can you imagine if that happened today? Can you, can you imagine? Jim and Susie come to church. They try to deceive people. Not done. Billy Bob and Wanda. Okay, I don't know a Billy Bob and I don't know a Wanda. There you go. Billy Bob and Shaniqua. I don't, whatever. And what they did in the book of Acts is that they pretended to be these people of great generosity and they lied. And they did it so they could receive greater honor before all the people. And they lied to the Holy Spirit. And a word of knowledge comes to the apostle and he says, did you do such and such and so and so? Yes, I did. And, and he says, you've not lied to man, but you've, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And he drops dead in church. It's the book of Acts. Acts, the book of Acts. He drops dead. And the youth ministry come and carry him out. A few hours later, his wife, Shaniqua, or whatever her name was, fill in the blank, shows up and She's asked the same question. She could repent, but she doesn't. She holds to the lie. She was shopping downtown. She's back now, three hours later, and she drops dead. Why is that? Because they did not have a fear of the Lord. I believe one of the things that's happening in Eagle River, and one of the things that's happening here, certainly for me, is my fear of the Lord is being heightened. I understand the hour that we're in and the precipice that we're on and the importance of us following through on what God's calling us to do. And I understand that he, he doesn't just wink at your chicken crap anymore. Now I've tried to, I've tried to get rid of that, but I'm, I'm still working things out in certain areas. Attitudes. Anybody have an attitude besides me at some point this week? And it's only Wednesday. Anybody else repent yet this week? It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Second thing you'll see here. I'm just, I'm so glad that God loves us with all our chicken mess. But he loves us so much he refuses to leave us that way. And then he'll bring you in a service like this to get, get all up in your grill and help you so you can throw off whatever you need to throw off. You want to experience God's power, you got to live holy. And you need to live holy personally. And let me say, as a church, we need to live holy. And, and let me say that we do. We do. Things are, things are well here. There's integrity. There's, there's prayer. And we repent a lot. I don't mean for gross sin. We don't, we don't willfully sin. I don't willfully go out and do wrong. And if you do do that, you probably need to be born again. As the head goes, so goes the rest of the body. Something Pastor Karen said, you know, when God is touching the head, as it is in Psalm 133, the oil pours down onto the head, onto the body. It's a picture of the high priestly anointing, but it's also a picture that I understand. I can't preach to you, teach to you. I can't move you into a place that I'm not in. And I can prophesy and pray and believe to go there. And, and we do that. And we will do that. 
I don't think we're even at the ankle deep level of what God wants to do. I think we're headed for a super outpouring, a mega outpouring, an outpouring unprecedented. I've heard the prophetic words. I've read them. I've even prophesied some of them. Alaska is firmly positioned to see a great move of God that will affect the whole United States of America. Well, God's not going to come upon a chicken mess. Get involved in true worship. Everybody say, get involved in true worship. By praising God, singing and making music. I mean, you gotta work really hard theologically to get rid of instruments and singing in your worship service today. And there are some Christian cults that do just that. Using the Old Testament worship in the temple as a guide. It's David brought the ark. He worshiped before the Lord with all his might in a linen ephod. With all his might, he worshiped God. And he was laughed at by his wife. And, and uh, Pastor Karen preaches a message on Mikhail. Is that how you say her name? And it's, she was bitter in need of healing. And if you follow her story, it's understandable why she was. She just needed healing. You know, Jezebel just needs healing. Come on, someone say Ahab needs healing. Everyone needs healing. People that hurt people are just hurt. So if they can get healed, then they will no longer hurt people. David was criticized by her and says, Oh, how wonderful king of Israel. And he said, Oh, I will yet become more undignified. He said, I will worship God with everything that I have. That's what that means. I don't care what somebody thinks about how I worship God. Years ago when I first got here, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of an extra worshiper and um, <laughs> and those years ago when I came in the early years I would worship and spin and spin around like a top in one place but there's only you know 30 people here 20 to 30 people and um, I started feeling like people are staring at me and um, yeah, I didn't like that too much. And I felt like, man, I'm just feel like I'm putting on a show, but Lord, this is how I worship. So I just, I was so grieved. I thought, man, I just need to calm down. I need to calm down. I need to just relax. I called Dr. Morocco. I said, Pastor Morocco, you know, I just, you know, I'm a little extra in my worship. Yes, Daniel, I know. I was, I was in my 40s, 45 years old. I was at a youth convention with Dr. Morocco. I'm sitting with all the dignified older guys. And there's a thousand youth up front, marching in place like this, all before the service. I'm like, ooh, boy, they're gonna worship God. Those guys are gonna worship. And I'm sitting there. And, and they, they start and they're like, hey, hey, hey. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm with the geezers. Jesus, help me. And I'm sitting there just, but I have to behave myself because I'm like the armor bearer, you know, and I'm there and Dr. Morocco's there. And he says, Daniel. I'm like, yeah. He says, go ahead. I'm like, ah! Oh, yes. <laughs> I called him, you know what his advice to me was? You, you, you think that my pastor or senior global pastor, you think he said, yes, you need to just, just keep it, you know, keep it, you know, you don't want to offend anybody. You know what he said to me? He said, oh, Daniel, just love God like you love God. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about any of those people. I said, okay, okay, come on, somebody. Gonna worship him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. I'm not gonna shrink back. I'm not gonna stop. I'm gonna worship God. Shout to God. All right, sit down. You know you're having church when you get out of breath. Insights from the New Testament as I put down the wheels for landing. Ah, I love you, Lord. 
and I will yet become more undignified. Oh, we worship you. Not the approval of man. We worship you. I did not come for the ring or the robe. I came to worship you. I came to worship you. Something happens when I praise your name. Something happens when I praise your name. When I lift you high. When I glorify. Something happens when I praise your name. Mm. Demons flee when I praise your name. Healing flows when I praise your name. Something happens when I praise your name. When I praise your name, I praise your name, I praise your name. Bodies are healed when I praise your name. Blind eyes open when I praise your name. Sickness flees when I praise the name of Jesus. (laughs) I have preached myself happy. Let him touch you. Let him touch you. I know there's more notes. And they're good ones. It's 8.33 or 34 by AT&T time. Would you give me just would you give me just five more minutes? Insights from the New Testament. Hebrews 13 and 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips that continually profess His name. What's a sacrifice of praise? When you don't feel like it, you do it anyway because He's worthy. In Ephesians 5 and 18. Come on, are you ready? Do not be drunk with wine or smoke weed, which is a debauchery. Instead, be... In, in, instead, 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 be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. I'm going to tell you there's something that's far better than weed, far better than drink, far better than anything. He's better than wine. His love is better than wine. That's what Song of Solomon said. Oh, how he, when he touches me, everything changes. He takes away the pain. He releases courage and power to the weak. Colossians 3 and 16, let the message of, man, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Man, he's, he's here. Come on, somebody say he's here. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach, admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. That's talking about praying in tongues. So there's praying with words. May the Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance towards you. May he be gracious to you and may he give you peace. The high priestly prayer, those were words. But there's also praying in the spirit. And Corinthians talks about when there's a message given in tongues that needs to be interpreted, which is prophecy, basically. But there's also a congregational lifting of our voice in the Spirit, praying in our heavenly language. And and that's what you'll hear when you come into this place at times, many times. 
My, my, my. Everybody say pray. pray. First Corinthians 14, 14 to 15. You can go and read it later. Jude 1 and 20. Build up yourselves, your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. That's praying in your heavenly language yet again. In James 5 and 16, therefore confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. Pray for, talking about experiencing the power of God. Prayer. This prayer is the backbone of everything we do. Are you guys all right? Prayer is the back. Listen, I'm going to advise to you if I, if I can pass, give you some pastoral wisdom. Let prayer be the first thing and the last thing that comes off of your mouth. Let prayer be the, the very essence of the fabric of your life. You let prayer, you let you just soak in prayer. Spend time in prayer with prayers and petitions and requests. Make your needs known to God and the peace of God will tra- Come on, be anxious for nothing, says the Apostle Paul to the church of Philippi. But by prayer and supplication, come on, if you get to a place where you're filled with anxiety, and you're filled with fear, that is the indication that it's time for a prayer meeting. Don't just sit there and be tormented. Ephesians 6 and 18, and pray on all occasions. I'm talking about how to experience God's presence. Worship, prayer, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert always. Keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Come on, somebody say amen. Romans 8 and verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. And he who searches the hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Talking about experience, God's power, God's presence. He's here. Come on, say it. He's here. Thirdly, give. I'm going to finish this thing. Come on, somebody say give. Philippians 4 and 8, it talks about this beautiful sacrificial gift that they give. Giving is a part of worship. The Holy Spirit's at work when you give, when you tithe, when you give, when you sow. The Holy Spirit's at work and His power comes on sacrifice and giving. Say that with me. Say power comes on sacrifice and giving. And it's more than just about money. It's your heart. Everybody say it's my heart but your money is also can be attached to your heart where your treasure is there your heart will be also your treasure needs to be in heaven that's way it's that way it's not hard to write a 1.2 million dollar check perhaps preach the word look at four preach the word when i go into a church or i visit a place where there's not strong worship or there's not a i, I mean i love worship but when there's not strong worship and it just feels like it's flat then I preach the word until the place opens. You, you, can, you can break a place open. You can set people free for preaching. It's happened even today. Something's happened in some of you. You're like, man, I can feel like something happening. Oh, worship team. I can feel something happening right now. It's because the word is being preached under an unction of heaven. Precious ladies, stand up on your feet. Yes. Oh, you're in a wheelchair and you're going to stand anyway. Father in Jesus, hey, I know you guys. <laughs> Stand up, it's the Pridgens. Father, thank you. Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Fire. Fire. It's not even remotely done with you. There's a lot more to be done. You can preach and break open a place. Lift your hands to heaven. I'm, I'm almost concluded. What did I say, five minutes? Okay, give me five more. It's 8.40, there's nothing on YouTube that you can't watch later. Colossians 2 and 8. Listen closely to this, please. We're talking about, really, revival. We're talking about Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. We're talking about God is here, and it's not by accident. There are steps that you can take to see God's power flood your home. And if you leave this place thinking, well, that, that, that I felt something, there's something's going on there. Man, God is in that place, that church. Then you've, then you've missed the whole point of the message. Because yes, he is here, but he's also in you. He's also in you. And when you go home, God goes with you. You can lift your hands and experience the power of God in your own kitchen, in your own living room. Well, yeah, you might need to get rid of some stuff. You might need to step away from the chicken coop. You know what I'm saying? 
See to it, Colossians 2 and 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, deceptive philosophy. Oh gosh, it's everywhere. Which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off. Come on, someone say my flesh was put off. My flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. You once were dead in your sins, verse 13. And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. Come on, say that. God made me alive with Christ. God made me alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away and nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, trying for cross oh come on he made a way he made a way he made a way he made a way come on he made a way in conclusion I went 23 minutes and eight seconds over my allotted preaching time. Imagine that. It's a guideline. Lastly, for all of you note takers, let the Holy Spirit manifest himself through his gifts. Let me say that again. Let the Holy Spirit manifest himself through his gifts. Can I have one of those prayer cloths, please? Just hustle it up here. We don't really understand what manifest means. If something is hidden, you cannot see it. So you can't see the fullness of this sacred desk, as they used to call it. Pulpit. Podium, some call it. I like sacred desk can't really see it because it's covered. If I was to pull this cloth off, it would then be made manifest. Ready? One, two. The Holy Spirit wants to manifest. We pray for moves of God. You pray for moves of God across America, across the nations of the world. We say, oh God, send a move of your Holy Spirit. When God sends a move of the Holy Spirit, it's more than just your hair standing on end. There's actually gifts that are then manifest and released. There's healing, miracles, signs, and wonders. If you need healing in your body, I want to invite you to come up right now and receive it. If you need a miracle, you come up front right now. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, just respond. Quickly come all the way up to the front. We're going to worship God and we're just going to let his presence fill this place. I'm not going to go much longer, but I hope that you hear what I preach to you under the unction of the spirit tonight, that you are his house, that he lives on the inside of you, that God in you is bigger than any obstacle you face. He can heal your marriage, heal your body, heal your, he can heal your finances. He can set you free online. Come on, we're going to worship God. Everything you got. Right now, Holy Spirit, come. Release your power right now. Holy Spirit, feel this heart. Right now in Jesus' name. Now just forget about the time. Forget about eating dinner and sing with all your heart. See if we can get a one accord tonight.
prayed for and you're receiving. I want to speak to those who might not know Christ. Maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. This is the service to do that in. Won't you do it today? He said, well, I, I think I gave my life to God when I was a kid. Well, I think you did. You would know. And your life would show evidence and proof of that. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't leave this place in that condition. Religion is not what you need. What you need is a relationship with Jesus. And the only way to find to get that relationship is to receive his free gift. I've said it before recently, so many times in past services, there's only one sin that God can't forgive you of. There's only one. Now there's a lot of sins that I can think of. There's a lot of things that I did in my life, but there's only one sin that he cannot forgive you of. To do so would be against all of scripture and to deny who he is. There's only one sin. You know what the one sin is? It's denying the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and repenting and receiving him. Repent means to, to think again, to re again, pent, think. The only sin that you and I can't be forgiven of, now I've made a decision. So I'll just talk about maybe you. The only sin that you can't be forgiven of is receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is the only sin. All other sins he can forgive you of. You say, well, I, I've not, I don't, I don't think I've done that. Well, do it now. I was in a, a hat store in Amarillo, Texas last week precious girl who I hope is online. I asked her if she died, she was going to go to heaven. She says, no. I said, have you, you ever received Jesus? She said, no. Her mother was born again, but she wasn't. 23 years old, a broken young girl. I said, well, you believe in Jesus, don't you? I believe. I believe he died on a cross. I said, but you haven't received him. She says, no. I said, well, give me your hand because you're going to do it right now. She's like, all right. She prayed, she, she received Jesus, she got born again. You could see, the lights went on. I hope she's in church. She said, is it that easy? Religion makes it hard. But the simplicity of the good news is this, the simplicity of the gospel is you, you believe in your heart and God has given every man a measure of faith. You believe in your heart that God sent his only son to die on a cross for your sin and for mine. And you repent, you ask him to forgive you for where you've done all the chicken mess. You ask him to forgive you of your sin. You say, that's me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And then we'll close this service. You want to get right with Jesus. You want to give your heart to Jesus for the first time, or maybe you want to make a recommitment to him all across this place. You say, pastor, that's me. No one looking around for now. You say, that's me, pastor. On the count of three, slip your hand up. Nobody leaving. Don't go to the bathroom. It's not time to do that. You can wait. Just wait. Very important time. I don't want anybody distracted. You want to give your heart to Jesus for the first time. Or number two, you want to make a recommitment. You used to live for him, but you know you have compromise and you want to come home. You want to recommit to Christ. Or number three, the devil lies to you and you're just not sure. And you want to be sure. Any of those categories. One, give your heart to Jesus. Two, recommit your life. Three, you just want to be sure. On the count of three, would you slip your hand up? You want to be included in this prayer. On the count of three, won't you do it? One, two, three. Slip your hand up high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Slip your, unashamed. Slip your hand up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. I see that hand. I see that hand in the back. Thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. I see that hand. Thank you, son. Over on this side, you want to get right with God. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Lift your hand high. I want you to pray this with me right out loud. Right out loud. And then we're going to dismiss our service so we don't burn out all of our children's workers. Come on, somebody say amen. Pray this with me right out loud. All across this place will be people praying for the first time, people recommitting, and people like myself affirming my faith in Christ once again. Pray with me right out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sin. Forgive me. Wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. I'm coming to you the best way I know how. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Live inside my heart. Take out the heart of stone. Put in the heart of flesh. Use me for the purpose for which he created me. 
Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen.